Okay, welcome everybody. As you are making yourself um, situated in today's Zoom session, I'll ask just to check your audio controls, make sure that you are um, muted for the session. We'll give it just another minute um, for folks to settle in and then we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you again for joining us for the Firefighter Cancer Initiative uh, monthly seminar. Okay, so if you're just joining us, we're going to go ahead and get started in just a couple of seconds. So um, go ahead and get situated with the Zoom controls. Make sure that you are um, muted on your end, and uh, we'll, we'll start momentarily. Okay, it is 12.02 um, Eastern Standard Time, and it is time for Firefighter Cancer Initiative monthly seminar. My name is Alberto Caban Martinez, um, and along with uh, my colleague, Dr. Natasha schaefer Sally here, we serve as the deputy directors for the Firefighter Cancer Initiative. We're joined also by um, our, our lead project manager, Ms. Tara Greenberg, and our FCI director, Ms. Cynthia Theory. Um, you are joining us for our monthly Firefighter Cancer Initiative session, um, where we bring um, uh, guest uh, scientists um, or FCI scientists to speak about um, what they're working on for their project on firefighter cancer uh, research. Um, so today we have a very unique presentation. One of our uh, trainees will be presenting from our environmental sampling program. Um, and this one's extra special. She's one of uh, my, the trainees that I get to work with along with Dr. Sylvia Donner. Um, so it is my privilege to introduce and present to you um, uh, Alexia, who will be uh, presenting on today's topic of biomonitoring methods for quantitative assessment of occupational carcinogen exposure in our Florida firefighters. Um, so Alexia is actually a fellow of the ULINC program here at the University of Miami, as well as a doctoral candidate in the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology. She has a Bachelor of Science degree in Molecular Biology and Genetics from Democritus University of Thrace, and a Master's of Science in Reproductive and Regenerative Medicine from the National and Capsodistrain University of Athens, Greece. Her research focuses primarily on the development of biomonitoring methods for the interdisciplinary assessment of occupational carcinogen exposure and the investigation of the resulting microbiome alterations. So please join me in welcoming Alexia. For today's presentation, before she begins speaking, you have a couple of options on how you can ask questions. So you can pop them into the chat on the right-hand side of your screen, um, and we will entertain those at the end, or you can also um, speak out loud. Uh, the question at the conclusion of the presentation. So without further ado, I turn it over to Alexia. So hi everyone. Thank you so much, Dr. Caban Martinez for your introduction. Um, I am very happy to be here today and giving this uh, talk and share with you some of our findings uh, that we have from the environmental sampling program. And as Dr. Caban Martinez mentioned, I uh, will be discussing our biomonitoring methods for the quantitative assessment of occupational carcinogen exposure in Florida firefighters. So I will start off with some backgrounds uh, and describe our research strategy and the methods that we use, and then continue with our results and some concluding uh, remarks. So as you know, um, ESP is very interested in assessing the effect of uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which is a class of organic compounds that contains more than 100 chemicals. They are formed by the incomplete combustion of organic matter, such as wood or coal. And as you can see, they contain two or more uh, aromatic rings fused together. 
And these are very toxic compounds and they are considered to be um, persistent environmental pollutants. And this is because they're highly hydrophobic. So this means that they cannot dissolve in water and they tend to accumulate uh, in the sediment when they are released in, um, in the water, for example, in municipal discharge. In the general population, there are three main routes of exposure, and these are inhalation, as you can see here, ingestion of PAH contaminated for food or, or water, and of course we have dermal deposition. And it has been well established that if you have high levels of uh, exposure to PAHs, uh, this can lead to serious health effects. And the effect and the way of uh, action of PAHs it depends on their molecular weight um, and we group them into two uh, main categories. We have those with the low and those with the high molecular weight pHs and low, low molecular weight. So the low molecular weight pHs are those that contain two or three aromatic rings. They act as co-carcinogens at initial um, stages of cancer. Um, they can dysregulate gut junction channels and they can interfere uh, in that way with intercellular communication while they also affect uh, MAP kinases. And this can lead to activation of transcription factors, which then in turn uh, will be involved um, in the cell proliferation and disrupt that. Now, the high molecular weight PAHs are the ones that contain four or more aromatic rings uh, fused together. And these are considered to cause uh, mutagenesis, essentially mutations. In order to do that, um, they need to be metabolically activated. And the result of uh, this metabolic activation is uh, the formation of active metabolites that have high affinity for nucleic acids and proteins. And um, now certain complexes that are called adducts are formed between these biomarkers, um, excuse me, these uh, biomolecules and the PAH uh, metabolites. And this can impair their proper, proper uh, their, um, their function essentially. And we have the stable DNA adducts that can cause DNA replication errors or the unstable ones that will lead to the removal of uh, purine bases. Um, now PAHs are metabolically activated through three major uh, pathways in the cells. We have the diol epoxide pathway shown here vertically. We have the radical cation pathway shown at the top of the screen. And we also have the aldoketoreductase pathway or for short, AKR or okinone pathway. Um, and this figure shows, for example, the uh, metabolism of benzoalpha pyrene. And let's look a little bit more into each of these pathways. Now in the diol epoxide pathway, we have uh, activation uh, by CYP450 monoxygenases, uh, which will catalyze the formation of uh, highly mutagenic Bay region, we call this for this region here, diol epoxides. And these will go on and form stable DNA adducts, uh, which as I said, they lead to replication errors. Um, and alternatively, uh, if we are in the uh, radical cation pathway, then we have one electron oxidation by, uh, again, uh, CYP450, but this time it's a peroxidase that will lead to uh, reactive PAH radical cations shown here. And these can form unstable adducts that can lead to the removal of uh, purines. And the final pathway, uh, the less common one, is the AKR or okinone pathway, as I mentioned. And here we have the activation of intermediate dehydrodiols by the AKRs. And this will lead to the formation of redox active okinones, which can also form adducts. So um, it is evident that um, PAH exposure can lead to carcinogenesis. And numerous uh, studies, as you can see, they have observed an elevated risk for various cancer types in firefighters compared to the general population. And that's the reason why the International Agency for Cancer Research, or for short IARC, has uh, classified occupational firefighting as a possible human carcinogen. Now, closer to home, a retrospective cohort study performed by uh, our own, uh, our FCI's uh, Dr. David Lee and his group uh, used data from the Florida Firefighter Cancer Registry for the years 1981 to 2014. So they examined uh, the cancer risk in over 100,000 career Florida firefighters. And the male, uh, the male firefighters shown here, they were found to have an elevated risk for melanoma, thyroid, colon, 
prostate and testicular cancer, whereas the females were found to have an elevated risk for melanoma, thyroid, so this is common between the two genders. And here we also have uh, a highly increased risk for brain cancer. And another very uh, interesting observation is that uh, the firefighters had a younger age of cancer diagnosis at 42 years compared to uh, controls who have uh, 64 years uh, mean age of diagnosis. Um, so it is very obvious that being able to assess the PAH exposure, um, it is very important. And there are various biomarkers out there in the literature um, such as measuring par parent or else un the unmetabolized PAHs in urine or particulate matter. Um, also another uh, biomarker is measuring the pH metabolites, uh, mainly in urine, uh, looking at the formation of uh, adducts between the PAHs and DNA or protein, or examining uh, for um, cytogenetic uh, alterations such as um, structural chromosomal uh, anomalies or maybe the formation of micronuclei. Uh, obviously, as you can understand, each biomarker has its own advantages and drawbacks, but in our case, uh, we opted to measure PAHs that are excreted in urine. Um, this is a biomarker that is corroborated by several studies um, because um, parent compound elimination is directly associated with uh, previous exposure. And this integrates all potential uh, routes of exposure. And another advantage that we have here is that we have high specificity and it's uh, less susceptible to intra-individual variability. So let's move to our research summary. Here, what you see is a bird's eye view of what we did in, in, of what we did in this study. So let's break it down a bit. The first step was obviously to enroll uh, different groups of firefighters in our study and collect their urine uh, before and after being exposed to fire trainings or active duty. Our participants were present in class A fires that are shown here, which uh, most of you already know this. They involve burning uh, ordinary combustible materials like wood or paper, plastic, um, textiles, stuff like that. And then alternatively, uh, we had people that, that uh, were exposed to class B fires, and these are uh, fires with flammable liquids like petrol, oil, paints, solvents, and stuff like that. The next part after collecting the samples was obviously to analyze them. Um, so as I mentioned, PAHs are hydrophobic, uh, and this means they don't like being in an aqueous solution, um, which is like, for example, urine. And um, instead they prefer being in organic solvents. And this is a characteristic of theirs that we utilize here. And the first step obviously was to separate them, uh, which means to extract them from the matrix they're in. Um, and that's the urine obviously. And then we run the extracts through the GCMS in order to qualitatively and quantitatively assess them. Uh, sorry. Um... I see some questions in the chat. I was wondering if there's a, an issue going on with the presentation. Um, no, I will no, continue. You're, you're okay, Alexa, please, please continue. Okay, all right. Um, okay, so let's take a deeper dive into our methods. As I mentioned, the first step of our analysis involves uh, pressurized solvent extraction of the PAHs from the urine samples. And uh, we do that using an instrument that you can see here, it is called the Dionex. And this allows us uh, to extract the PAHs in a manner that it is rapid, it is safe, and it is automated. Um, in the past, we have uh, tested numerous methods, uh, but um, this particular method is now our method of choice because it allows us to process more samples in less time, which is very important. And also we are using less volume of organic solvents compared to previous methods or methods that we can be found in the literature. Um, so the main advantages that we have here is that we have higher accuracy and reproducibility of our findings. And of course, we minimize the cost, the time that is needed for the processing of the sample. And we also minimize our own exposure to solvents. And looking a little bit into the method, so the samples are placed inside a cell. This is the cell. It kind of look like, looks like a mini dumbbell, I guess, that you use for working out. Um, and then this cell goes inside the oven that can be seen here. Um, and it will be filled with uh, solvent of our choice and heated uh, to a temperature of approximately 100 degrees Celsius uh, in order to increase the extraction efficiency. And um, 
this elevated pressure, uh, excuse me, temperature can lead to the evaporation of the solvents and we don't want that. So that reason we apply elevated pressure to make sure that our solvents stay in the liquid state. And then the sample will sit in this, you know, uh, exposed, I guess, such a situation of, uh, you know, being exposed to the solvents uh, for a time that we have determined. And afterwards, fresh solvents will be pumped through the cell and uh, then we will have nitrogen purging. And essentially the PAHs are released into collection bottles. They can also be visualized in this schematic here um, that we can use for our next step of analysis. But uh, essentially what we do here is that we apply uh, increased temperature and pressure in order to increase the solubility of the analytes uh, decrease the viscosity of the solvents, and we also uh, have improved analyte diffusion into the solvents. And the next step is gas chromatography and mass spectrometry, which is a combination of analytical techniques that, um, as you know, are used to separate and identify the individual components uh, of a sample. Now, firstly, the sample is injected through the injector port into the GC instrument that can be seen here. And this is connected to a tank that contains an inert gas. In our case, it's helium. Um, uh, we want that because we don't want the gas to react to the compounds of interest, that's the pHs. Um, and it, this gas will also help them pass through the capillary column that you can see here as uh, you know, this spiral. Uh, spiral. Um, and this spiral, this column, it provides a surface uh, for the sample to interact with. And in that way, it allows the separation to happen based on each compound's volatility and mass. And the next part involves the mass spectrometer, which is this one here. So the MS will ionize the chemical compounds, uh, and in that way, it will produce unique fragments that are positively charged. And then these ions will pass through an electromagnetic field that will filter them based on their uh, mass. And the ions will go and reach the detector that can be shown here. The detector will amplify and count the number of ions that are associated with that particular mass. Essentially, it measures their mass to charge ratio. And the output is a generated spectrum that will be then matched against a library of compounds uh, with known spectra. And this allows us, allows us to identify uh, the compound that is inside the sample. And as you know, in research, um, it's not all cream and, creams and peaches. A big part of what we do in the environmental sampling program is developing and optimizing methods uh, for the analysis of the FC, FCI samples. And this is a process that can be tedious, it can be frustrating, it involves a lot of trial, a trial and error. Um, I want to be mindful of your time, so I will just skim over the optimization process and only mentioned that the most important step for us was to determine uh, which solvent, either alone or in combination with other solvents, would be appropriate for the extraction. And for that purpose, we used controlled human urine uh, spiked with a mixture of PAHs. And the box plot that you can see here on the right of the screen uh, shows some of the solvents that we tested, which are uh, dechloromethane in equal volume with acetone, shown in orange, the chloromethane in equal volume with ethyl acetate, shown in red, hexanes in equal volume with ethyl acetate, uh, shown in light blue, and darker blue, dichloromethane alone. Um, and the green that you see here is um, our internal pH standard as a control. And you can see that uh, this CM with acetone uh, was the combination that had the best recovery. Um, of approximately 85% uh, in the highest molecular weight pages, which are also the most carcinogenic of uh, the group we're looking at. And other uh, parameters we tested were the temperature, the volume, um, and so on, but I will not uh, tire you with that. And um, this scatter plot here, it shows the dynamic range of our in-style analytical method. Um, again, we used control urine spiked in increasing concentrations, starting from zero ppb, going all the way to 200 uh, parts per billion. So we have 0, 10, 20, 40, 80, 100, and 150 parts per billion. And uh, we had an excellent correlation of what was spiked in the urine and what was extracted and afterwards detected by the GCMS. 
as you can see from here. And um, PAHs is, is uh, you know, it's, it's this group of uh, hundreds of compounds, as I mentioned earlier, but in our case, we are interested in 16 PAHs that have been flagged by the United States Environmental Potential uh, Protection Ag Agency as uh, highly toxic and they're compounds of interest. And this is uh, their individual scatter plots and correlation coefficients uh, for an analytical method. You will notice that naphthalene, which is also the lowest molecular weight pH, is also the one that had the lowest correlation coefficient out of all the pHs that we detected. And um, I think this could be attributed to its high volatility that can affect um, the method's efficiency. However, you can notice uh, that as we increase uh, in molecular weight, uh, we also increase in um, efficiency of the method and R squared value. So let's continue with our results. Um, there we go. Okay. So now that we knew that these techniques can successfully detect PAHs in clinical samples, we were able to start analyzing actual firefighter samples. And as you can see, we have collected urine samples from various subgroups of firefighters. In particular, we have 21 new recruits uh, from whom we collected uh, urine at baseline and after different live fire training exercises. We also uh, recruited four trainers um, from whom we collected urine before and after participating um, in a fire training exercise. Uh, we also had 25 fire active firefighters from whom we collected urine before and after uh, the completion of a 24 hour shift. And of course we could not omit having um, our controls. In this case, it's 21 controls. It's commercially available urine in our case. And um, the first data that I want to share with you are those from our controls. And the reason I do this is because I want you to have a point of reference of what is the anticipated PAH levels in an unexposed population. So as you can see in each column, uh, we have a different control sample. And in each row, we have a different PAH. Lower molecular weight PAHs can be found on the top part of the heat map and the higher ones can be found at the lower part of the heat map. Um, and as you can see, we have barely detectable concentration of PAHs throughout all samples, uh, which is a finding that agrees uh, with what uh, CDC and NIOSH estimates uh, for the general population. So let's move on to our firefighters. And I'll start off with our new recruits um, or rookies, however you wanna call them. Um, we had 21 male participants with a mean age of 28.9 years. 81% were Hispanic and 19% were non-Hispanic. Uh, their average BMI was 28.2 and their mean experience was 1.2 years. Um, I should mention here that most participants were completely inexperienced, but there were a couple who had prior experience in the fire service and that's what's pulling up the experience. Um, the first um, heat map that I will be showing you, it represents the internalized exposure to individual PAHs as detected in their urine at baseline. So this is before they participated in any training exercises. And you will see that most PAHs for most participants are in non-concerning levels with few exceptions um, at, the topper, um, at the upper half of the screen. Um, and this could potentially be attributed and explained by their you know, lifestyle. Um, moving on to how their exposure looks after they participated to a class A fire, which I will remind you is what we call fires that derive from solid combustible materials. Now here we see that we are mainly de detecting the lower molecular weight PAHs. So that's the darker blue that I'm showing you here. Um, rather than the higher molecular weight ones, which can be found here. Um, and switching to class B fire, we see a very different uh, image. Um, class B fires are the ones, as I mentioned, that come from flammable liquids. Here we have much higher level of pHs across uh, all participants, or most of them at least, and, all P and most types of uh, pHs. Uh, and this is you know, a, a very concerning finding. Um, classes, class B fires, uh, they can burn at higher temperatures 
uh, they are often um, harder to put out and this could lead to higher increased release essentially of all pHs and particularly the higher molecular weight uh, pH, um, which are, as I said, are the mutagenic ones. Um, and finally, here we have the, the urine that was collected from this group, the new recruits, at 18 hours after the class B fire was complete. We observed that compared to their initial exposure right after the fires, the levels have dropped. So if you look at this heat map and this heat map, we certainly see uh, a decrease in, in concentrations. Um, and this could be explained because at, at that time point, the PAHs uh, are starting to get metabolized into other forms. Um, however, we see that despite this drop, which was expected, we still have very high levels of exposure, particularly in the higher molecular weight uh, ones. And uh, there we go, sorry. Okay, there we go. And in this cumulative heat map, we can see the total PAH exposure. So this is all, all the PAHs grouped together uh, in the new recruits through the four different time points and collection events. So we have baseline, class A, class B, and class B plus 18 hours, same for the dot plot. And it is very easy to visualize both in the heat map and in the dot plot that the, the type of fire and the collection time time, they can affect significantly uh, the total levels of pH exposure. And class B has the highest concentrations, as you can see, of um, individual and total pHs. Our next groups, a group, excuse me, is uh, the firefighter instructors or fire, uh, or fire trainers. Here we had four male participants with a mean age of 38.3 years old. 25% uh, were Hispanic, 75% were non-Hispanic. Uh, their mean BMI is 22.5. Uh, they were very fit actually. And their mean experience is uh, 13 years. So um, we collected their urine uh, before and after a class B fire, um, which I've already explained what it is, the liquid flammable materials. And in the heat map, each row, it represents uh, a PAH, a different PAH of the 16 that we are interested in detecting. And each column is grouped by participants. So we have before and after uh, the exposure. And what we observed is that trainers, as you can see, trainer one and trainer three, they have a tendency to have more PAHs after the fire, while trainers two and four, they tend to have less. Um, this is a statistically non-significant finding, uh, but at the same time, we did not have many participants in this group. Therefore, um, it would be interesting in the future to see how these results shape uh, when more people are involved. And our final group is the active firefighters. Uh, so here we had 25 participants, uh, 24 were male, one was female. Um, their mean age is uh, 41.6 years, 44% were Hispanic, 52% were non-Hispanic. Um, one person did not disclose the ethnicity, hence the discrepancy that you see. The BMIs, uh, their mean BMI was 28.8 and their mean experience was 15 years. And in this bar plot, we can see the total um, exposure of the 25 active firefighters from whom we collected urine before and after they attended uh, a 24 hour shift. The X axis, as you can see, it represents um, the firefighters and the Y axis represents the concentration of total pHs in their urine. Uh, there was a significant, dif a significant uh, difference in the total levels of exposure uh, before and after during, during their shift um, with post shift levels that you can see in dark green color. Um, being much higher than the pre-shift ones, which is the lighter green color. And um, this finding was corroborated um, by our survey data as the firefighters who had the biggest increase in PAH uh, levels were also the ones who during their shift responded to actual fires. Um, there we go. And this is what we see in this, uh, in, in this combination of figures. On the left, we have the firefighters who responded to non-fire related calls. So this is emergency medical events and so on. 
Uh, whereas on the right, you can see firefighters uh, who attended fire related calls. So it is very obvious that the ones that responded to fire calls, they had a significant increase in total exposure, reaching very unsafe levels. And now looking at those who did not go to fire calls, there is mainly a decrease in PAH levels, which was not significant. Um, and it still remains much higher compared to what I showed you earlier regarding the, the control population. And um, something else to keep in mind is that not everyone responded to the same number of calls. And this is what we see here. It is a busy graph, bear with me. Um, it is the final one also. So the y-axis represents the number of fire calls that were answered. And the x-axis represents the different firefighters, each of whom is also color coded. And the size of the colored bubble um, is um, directly proportional to the uh, PAHs, the total PAHs that were detected in the urine. So the bigger the bubble, the, the more PAHs were detected in the urine after the end of the shift of this particular firefighter. Um, and what, what we can see here is that the highest concentrations, as you can see here, um, they can be found in firefighters who only responded to one fire-related event. And um, the theory, I guess, is that, you know, not all fire events are of the same magnitude. And we know that different type of... Um, um, that the type of materials that are being burned will also affect which PAHs will be released. Uh, but generally the take home message um, of this figure and generally of what I showed you today is that, uh, you know, regardless of the level of training, um, the firefighters face routine exposure to high uh, levels of uh, these carcinogens. And some concluding remarks and main points uh, for this talk is that um, we have in our hands a novel biomonitoring tool for the qualitative and quantitative assessment of the internalized uh, carcinogen exposure in clinical samples. And this is something that um, can allow us to streamline the large scale screening of uh, clinical samples. Um, we also observed uh, that class B fires, they contribute significantly to the PAH burdens of firefighters compared to class A fires. And we also detected uh, a significant increase in total exposure levels, even after a single 24 hour shift. And this change was, would range to 30, from 30 to 3000% change, which related um, to the type of call that was answered, but not to the number of calls. And more importantly, we have shown that firefighters, regardless of their uh, level of training, they have much higher levels of exposure compared to the controls and the general um, population. And with that, I would like to thank my co-advisors, Dr. Donard and Dr. Caban Martinez, as well as all of the members of my committee, Dr. Theo, Nawaz, and Schaefer Soli. I also want to thank uh, the state of Florida and the Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center for funding our study and our efforts. And uh, of course, I want to thank the Ulink Predoctoral Fellowship Program that funds uh, yours truly. Uh, and finally, I would like to thank and acknowledge all the members of uh, the Firefighter Cancer Initiative, uh, everyone in the Zonert and the Caban Martinez groups um, for their support in this project. And of course, all of the, the firefighters, the volunteers, the unions, everyone that participated in our study, uh, because you know, without them, we couldn't have done uh, this research. And with that, thank you to all of you. And I can take any questions. Awesome job, Alexia. Thank job. You. Great job. Yeah, Thank it's always guys. fascinating to see that. So I'm going to make just two really quick announcements and then we'll go over to, to Q&A. So I want to also, um, as you properly did, so just thank again, Dr. Sylvia Donner and Dr. Sapna Deo, uh, Dr. Amari Dikichi and other members of the biochemistry team um, who all, you know, collectively have put effort into this and, and Alexia to you for, you know, um, supporting the firefighters and believing in this research and making this happen. I think this is an important contribution. Um, for our firefight for the attendees that are on today's webinar, um, we are offering um, continuing education credit. Um, if you're a Florida firefighter, uh, you will provide your FCDICE uh, 
uh, number, right? Your Florida Department of Financial Services ID number to Ms. Tara Greenberg, who's on here. And my colleague, um, will, she will type her email address in the Q&A so you can reach her um, and provide that information to her. <clears throat> so we're going to go ahead and open it up for questions um, from the audience. Um, so if you look down on your Zoom session down below, there's a Q&A. Um, if you just pop in your question, we'll, we'll, we'll work through those individual ones. Um, okay, the first question, Alexia, for you is what foam was being used, what foam was being used in those uh, class B, was it class B fi fires, or was it some other type of combustible material that was being used um, in the experiment? Do you know? So class B fires, uh, they require the foams, um, we've already done some studies on um, you know, AFFF uh, paraffining foams. So class B fires are the ones that contain the AFFF uh, foams for the extinguishing. Um, it is, you know, of my knowledge that class A fires require a different type of foam, but I'm not sure, I, I do not have the information on which foams were used uh, to, in, in these particular instances. And also mind you that um, these are different groups and different fire events, so they don't necessarily overlap. Yeah, that's a great point that they are sort of different experiments. Um, okay, so another question, uh, nice work. Appreciate um, the lack of relationship between fire incidents and exposures. Do you think that the half-life of pH is excreted by urine, say from one hour uh, for Sorry. retinine to 10 hours for heavier PAHs could modify the measured levels in urine. So more that so more than others, depending on when the sample was collected. Yes, that, that is actually an excellent point. Um, this is certainly an, an issue. Um, the elimination time of the PAHs can definitely affect the, the outlook that we have uh, in our results. However, a reason why we want uh, to, to look at the parent compounds and not the individual metabolites is because it is easier to capture like the general picture rather than um, you know, the individual metabolites. And let's keep in mind the fact that uh, there's only, it's very common in the literature to use uh, the hydroxylated forms. However, there are other metabolites of PAHs that are not uh, very popular as biomarkers. And um, my fellow Greek, I'm gonna suggest, uh, I'm gonna guess here, um, Ilias Kavouras, who made that comment, um, has an excellent point uh, over there um, that it can affect our results, but it is uh, one of the um, methods and biomarkers to best capture uh, all routes of exposure and total pHs. Okay, excellent. Um, okay, we have another question for you um, from the audience. So recognizing the non-correlation of pH levels and number of fires, is there a correlation if you have data between pH levels and the size of a fire? For example, if one big fire versus several small ones. Um, that is actually a really good idea of something that could we could look into uh, the future. At the moment, we did not have uh, this kind of information as, uh, you know, as of the size of the fire, we did have um, some information about the, um, uh, the type of fire. Uh, unfortunately, not everyone uh, gave an answer. It would be very interesting. This is something that actually we would have loved uh, to have done. Um, you know, that bubble plot that I showed you where even just one fire can lead to uh, very high levels of PAHs. It would be very interesting to see what type of fire that was, um, but we did not have the data. Not everyone re responded to their survey questionnaires providing this data. Um, my guess though, just based on logic is, you know, um, the size could affect, but I think what's the most important factor over here is the type of materials that are burned and of course the time. So I'm guessing a, a big fire will take more time to be put out rather than uh, you know, a few small ones. And this will lead to um, more release of PAHs to the environment and of course the firefighters and you know, everyone present. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Are there any other additional questions um, from the audience today that you can um, post in the Q&A down below? Okay, well, one more. Um, did the participants in the study perform proper decontamination procedures after the fire? Oh, um, actually, that's a really good question. 
Um, so we have this uh, some to, to an extent we have that data for our active firefighters, and it is actually very interesting to see. Um, let me look. Um, I wonder, do I have this information here? Uh, hold on. Let's go here to the active firefighters. So we asked them, let me see. Yeah, we asked them if they showered after participating in the fire events and whether they cleaned the gear. Um, sadly, as I said before, an issue that we have with our firefighters, they, not everyone responds. And if any firefighter is now present, please make sure to respond to those surveys because we need the data. So when we asked them if they showered, 22 answered that they did uh, after their 24 hour shift and two did not, one did not respond. And when it comes to um, cleaning the gear, eight said that they did, 13 said that they didn't and the rest did not respond. So um, it would be very interesting, you know, if we could have the collective data and be able to see and you know that, that's something that we will be looking at, I guess, separating the ones who actually answered and see if showering actually helped have uh, less PAHs in the urine and if cleaning uh, the year also helped uh, with uh, you know, minimizing, I don't wanna say minimizing the exposure, or, but minimizing what can be you know, internalized. Yeah, absolutely. And just a clarifying question to your response. Um, were any of those questions, and remind me again, I should know this off the top of my head, but were any of them asking about if they deconned uh, immediately after the fire instead of waiting to shower back in the station? I, I think uh, we only asked about um, showering after and, and cleaning uh, the gear. Yes, so I'm pretty sure that these answers are, you know, uh, to that level, like when you reach the fire sen station, did you shower? I'm pretty sure that everyone, when they went home, they they showered, but I think the, the questions that we have here, the answers are what they did when they reached the station. Did okay. you shower at the station? Did you clean your gear? Right, so we didn't ask anything about on-scene decon. Uh, okay, so yeah, so the answer would be no, that we, we didn't assess uh, for immediate oh, on-scene so decon. So you mean uh, after the training events, but before returning to the, to the station? I don't think we have this information. Um, I would have noticed. I can check. I can definitely check again, but I do not think I, we have this information. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, uh, let's see here. I thought I saw another question, but maybe it disappeared. Yes, we have one um, in the chat. Um, could firefighter hydration levels or kidney function potentially affect measurements? Sorry, can you repeat the question or is it somewhere that I can read it? Uh, yes, it's in the chat. So could firefighter hydration levels or kidney function potentially affect measurements? Oh, definitely. Uh, you know, like um, it, it is... Um, it is something that to an extent can affect because uh, we've already said that, um, you know, pHs are metabolized through the kidneys and, you know, the liver and the bile and they are excre excreted in urine. So um, it could be, you know, if they are highly dehydrated, which I'm guessing is what's happening when they're going through these uh, high um, intensity training exercises or, you know, like high intensity work shifts. Um, this could be something that can lead to more retention of the PAHs and less elimination of them through the urine. So drink your water. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, hydration is critical to flushing things out of our system. Okay, next question is, um, with higher levels of PAHs and class B fires, and the use of foams with unknown health effects, should we be measuring both PAHs and, and foam byproduct exposures? Perhaps this could help chase down which types or mixtures of chemicals may increase the risk of cancer. Oh, yes. I, this is actually a really good, um, a really good point. It could be something, you know, a, a more holistic, I guess, effect, um, approach, not effect, approach of, you know, the, the exposures. Um, that are faced by the firefighters. Um, it could be something that we could look at in the future. Um, but at the you know at the current um, study, we are we're only focusing on the PAHs as excreted by the firefighters in the urine. Okay. Um, one of the questions from a firefighter asks, um, would the PAHs be excreted through sweat 
as well as urine? To a much lesser ex ex extent, uh, but it is mainly through through urine and some of it, you know, will go and um, depose itself. Like I guess, go sit on fatty tissue because they 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 are lipophilic. Uh, the PAHs. So sweat not as much. Uh, urine would be the number one way and for the for the excretion. Okay. Um, so another question asks: um, Do you know if the firefighters in your study had a second set of turnout gear to wear after the fire, and do they store their turnout gear um, outside of the fire living quarters? How oh, actually, Alberto? I don't know this. Uh, I don't have this information. Do we? This is a good point. Um, do we yeah, know? I'm not, I'm not sure for these. Uh, I'm, I'm blurring all of our experiments together into one. Um, so I don't know in, in these particular experiments if, if they have it. I know um, being that these studies are done here in South Florida, I know um, several of the fire departments do uh, tend to store their gear um, in a locker outside of the main living areas, but potentially in the bay or in a, an outside storage area. And, and some of the fire departments do have second set of gears um, that are available to them. Okay, we got one last question for you, which is um, on-scene decon is a big push right now, in addition to showering um, and washing gear after an incident. Were these participants washing gear or was there a buildup on gear over time? Also, is there any particular spot on the body where you see these getting absorbed or was, or was the detection or any detection devices worn? Okay, so plenty of, plenty of uh, things to say here. <clears throat> As uh, this person says, um, yes, it's very important to shower and wash the gear. Uh, it's a very good practice that needs to be established and, you know, followed, you know, to like a, like a religion, I guess, uh, in the firefighters. Uh, it must definitely be done. Um, as I said about these participants, whether they wash the, uh, the gear, um, we have that data for some of them, as I mentioned before, for the active firefighters. Uh, some of them did. Um, about one third, thirty percent of them cleaned their gear. Uh, mind you, you know, like from the top of my head, though, I I do remember in the questionnaire that some said that they only used water, and that you know does not necessarily cut it. Just water. You need water and you know some kind of soap soap to to wash away everything that's been accumulated the soap and whatnot um now if there is any particular spot on the body where i see i can stop sharing my screen uh where i can see these getting absorbed um well as i said uh we only looked at urine however you can see in the literature that one of them the areas that are most affected in the firefighters are, is the thyroid. And I'm guessing this happens because, you know, as the gear is, the, the area of the neck is exposed because, you know, they, it cannot be covered with fa fabric. They need to have, the, you know, a range of movements to be able to do this. So um, it is one of these areas that is um, very affected both in women and in men. Um, so this is something that, you know, needs to be looked at and potentially modify the uniforms to be able to protect the neck area as well. And I think the last part of the question was whether there was another device measured, um, used to measure. So that's a good point. Um, in our in VSP, we don't only do analysis of clinical samples. We also do um, analysis through uh, wristbands, silicone wristbands, work that is being done by our own Umer, uh, Umer Bakali. Um, brilliant scientist in our team, and he's able to detect um, PAHs in wristbands that are for, you know, worn um, by the firefighters during the fire exercises. Um, and this is um, an analysis, um, a cumulative analysis we will be sharing with you in a next seminar, not in this, in the current one. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and in fact, in one of our previous seminars, we looked at uh, skin cancer and its high rate within the fire service. Um, and some of our teams now are looking at the location of those skin cancers to understand how maybe personal protective gear may or may not be covering um, vulnerable areas of the skin um, and those exposures. 
Um, so we reached uh, the end, the end of our of our seminar series. Um, you know, on behalf of our cancer center and the Firefighter Cancer Initiative, um, and the state of Florida um, for uh, this continued work, um, we are thankful to Alexia um, uh, and the biochemistry team um, for this really important um, and a very interesting presentation. As a side note, she would not share with us the slides until she she was ready to present today, and uh, she was stellar. So um, thank you, um, thank you again, Alexia. Uh, Thanks Ms. for having me. <laughs> and Ms. Greenberg has posted in the. Uh, in the chat um, that you can uh, contact our firefighter study um, if you are a Florida firefighter, only if you're a Florida firefighter and would like continuing education. So you can send an email to firefighterstudy at miami.edu. Again, that's firefighterstudy at miami.edu um, and include your FCDICE number uh, so that you can receive continuing education for today's seminar. Thank you, everybody, and we will see you um, next month uh, for our continued FCI seminar series. Bye. And for those of you who maybe were not able to attend or friends that didn't have, um, I'm sorry, who have friends who maybe would like to attend, all of our seminar series are posted, the recordings on our Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center YouTube channel at our FCI playlist. And I am also happy to announce that all of the videos from the National Firefighter Cancer Symposium are posted there as well. So they're up as of today, so please share. Um, but of course, like I said, this will be posted um, in the next day, uh, the recording for anyone um, who else would, would like to view it. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. Okay, everyone, have a, have a good day. Bye. Bye. Thank you.